afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining our equity jam session. Um, as Natalie mentioned, this is an opportunity for us to have dialogue with one another. Um, we do not have a PowerPoint. We're not necessarily sharing new information per se. It's just an opportunity to talk and you know share ideas, practices. Um, if there's something that you all are dealing with at your respective agencies, um, with your students and classrooms, so on and so forth. It's just an opportunity for us to have a thinking session with one another. And um, we have prepared some kind of conversation starter questions um, so that we can jumpstart the conversation. But again, it's just an opportunity for us to all come together and just have robust discussion around the topic of equity. So before we jump in, I know for me, myself, um, and I do this all the time with our team, is just do a check-in, see how people are doing. So one of the questions, or two questions actually, that was asked of us in an equity-centered training is, how is it to be you in the world today? So anyone wants to share, how is it to be them at the world today or in the world today, excuse me? Anyone want to come off mute or even type in the chat? Again, this is an opportunity for us okay. to, um, to converse with one another. So thank you for you all who come off, um, uh, come on to camera and hopefully come mm -hmm. off mute. So how is it to be you in the world today? Well. I'll, I'll share. <clears throat> so to be me in the world today with um, four children under the age of 12 with Halloween days away, it is um, a sugary chaos and still trying to <laughs> get, you know, do all of the things. Um, but I am reminded of the season and the changing. And so to be me in the world today is just, um, you know, just full of joy to to see how they experience the world and those those little moments of of joy and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else want to share? I'll go ahead and share. Um, and it actually kind of goes with the second question that I will invite you all to um, answer. But um, how is it to be me in the world today? Um, I would say it's fast. It's I'm going at a fast pace. Um, there are a lot of moving parts. However, I am experiencing a lot of joy today. Um, you know, I was talking to Amanda Lee as we are designing the summit and um, hosting it. You know, you never really think about what it's like to host the summit, but then also to be a presenter multiple times. And so um, I was letting her know, like today for us both, it's one of our busiest days. We were in three sessions that we have been working on for some time now. However, I take pride and joy in knowing that it's all coming together. And this is day three of the summit. And hopefully you all are enjoying this experience. I know I am. And so to be able to keep up with all that's going on has been very fulfilling and very, it brings me a lot of lot of joy. So that how it is, that's how it is to be me in the world today. And Gino, I see you have your hand raised. I do. Uh, to, to be me in the world today. Um, I may wrinkle, I may raise some eyebrows here, but I'm I'm a retired person who doesn't like retirement. So I was very fortunate to for one of the consortia to reach out for me to continue doing what I do and even more. So I'm ecstatic. Wonderful. Yes, I did see you had joined a session as a presenter. So that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. All right, Karima. Oh, thank you. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. What uh, to be me in the world right now, uh, I'm stressed. <laughs> Everything is happening at the same time. Uh, and this is a wonderful conference and we're being hit with recent arrivals. From, mm. from Ukraine, from Russia, mm -hmm. from Latin mm -hmm. America, from Iran. Had mm -hmm. students this week who just came from Iran a week ago. Mm. So that's why I'm, I'm stressed. I want to remove the barriers and our systems are not set up to mm -hmm. support the recent arrivals. And it's frustrating. Mm. I feel like sometimes I'm just swimming against the current. So mm -hmm. it was it was heartwarming to hear you, Ver Veronica, and uh, it says Cape Tapa. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Mandalay. 
Mendeley, you know, we yeah. email. <laughs> We're going to need to a face. And that's where I am. So, but I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're, ha you're happy and you put on a wonderful summit. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. Um, definitely understand um, how it is to, you know, have all those things going on and being able to support your, your adult learners who who's arriving into your context. So absolutely. So kudos to you for, you know, making space to not only be responsive to their needs in this time, but then also making time to even be here at the conference. So we, mm -hmm. we appreciate you for all of it, for sure. All right. And I saw Dr. Zachary, thank you for being with us this afternoon. And yes, um, she also mentioned that, um, it's, um, moving fast. Absolutely. And yes, we are happy that you are finding time to have some nourishment, but then also still being very present with us. So we appreciate you. All right. Anyone else before we move into or dive into our topic for this afternoon? And for those of you who's joined us, um, this is an open dialogue. Um, you are free to come off mute um, as well as come on camera and um, dialogue with us, or you can stay off camera and type in the chat, whatever um, suits your needs at this time. So Tanya, I see you have come off mute. So um, I, I'm a little stressed. Um, we are um, nearing capacity and at capacity in several classes, and I was hoping to open registration again next week. Um, and um, I'm down a staff member, and unfortunately, I probably won't be able to open registration next week. And I'm very sad that um, we we just have like a lot of refugees coming in a lot of students that want to come and uh, unfortunately I'm just maxed out at the time at this moment mm -hmm. so um and then I'm sad that I have to be such a stickler on attendance because we are maxed out and students want to come and and uh, you know you want to help everybody so, right. so that's what I'm dealing with but I'm happy to be here with you guys today Yes, thank you. And thank you for being here, especially with all that you have going on. And hopefully, you know, you can um, have the find the extra staff person and be able to open registration so that those adult learners who are eager to come to your school are able to, to do so. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. And yes, we are very happy that you are here with us this afternoon, as well as everyone else. So if no one else wants to share, we can dive right into our topic. Um, not seeing anyone or anyone in the chat. Mm -hmm. So, so the first question is, um, what are some things that you personally or your organ and or your organization are doing in terms of equity? So thinking about how are you addressing equity in the classroom, at your school site, in your district, and within your community? What are some some equity centered activities that are going on? Anyone want to share? So I can share what's going on at our organization. Um, we are based at the Sacramento County Office of Education. And since I want to say 2021, so since last year, the County Office of Ed has partnered with the National Equity Project, and they have been putting on a series of trainings um, for the um, for SCOE employees as well as for the districts in areas um, such as leading for equity, um, learning how to have um, hard conversations, the development of an equity uh, center framework, um, the arts of conversation, um, how to lead equity in a meeting, whether it's a staff meeting, a community-based meeting, but always um, leading with equity equity in those meetings. And so it's been very rewarding to, to go through those sessions. Um, I know Mandalay and I, for the last couple of conferences that we've had, we have brought that information to the conference space and been able to share because everything that they share with us, they ask us to share with, with others. So we've been able to do that. So that's um, one of the ways our organization is um, um, what, what we're doing in terms of equity. So anyone else want to share? So I can share what the adult ed office is doing. And that is that we have a racial equity ad hoc committee. That is um, the one we've done a book study within our whole office on um, the blind spot. Mm. And um, all felt that was you know, an excellent book, really gave us a lot of things to talk about and think about in many areas. And we are working on <clears throat> 
some outside contracts to provide training for our office staff on all of us on racial equity. And then our goal is to bring to require equity training across the state with all of our providers. And that's that's kind of a couple year out goal, but we felt we had to work with ourselves first and mm -hmm. work internally before we could um, ask others to. So we felt modeling was appropriate. Yeah, sure. absolutely. I'm definitely a proponent of um, starting with self when it comes to equity centered work and then moving to the organization. So yes, thank you so much for sharing Dr. Zachary. And Kareem, I see you have your hand raised. Sure, um, thank you. At Southback College in our district, South Orange County Community College District, we're, we're doing a lot. I'm just gonna give you a brief summary. Currently, we are working with Dr. Regina Stroud to have um, to have equity training for us every Friday now since August. And it's time consuming, but it's working very well. Uh, and we have it for different groups. We have the, the council, and I sit on the uh, equity and inclusion council council at the, at the college level, and we have it for faculty, for staff. We started with the leadership, and then we're rolling it out to everyone. At the district level, the committee, uh, the hiring committees, we for hiring committees, all hiring committees, we <coughs> have implicit, uh, mandatory implicit bias training. Uh, I just, I have, and, and we have to go and get training, uh, not just on committee, we are required to have that, but we have to have up-to-date training for any committee we serve uh, We serve on. And we're also, I sat on a work group to recommend a new consultant to redesign our training and redesign Dr. Vernay Myers, the Vernay Myers uh, uh, company, and it's Vernay Myers. I don't know if you're familiar with her. So the little work group, we had a work group that's district-wide and we selected Vernay Myers to, uh, to review our current implicit bias training and revamp it. So these are just few things we're doing. We do, of course, the One Book, One College, we, we, all our books are, uh, are around equity. So we're trying to get the whole college and the whole district, because Irvine Valley College is our sister college, to, to really put our, uh, our, what is it, our money, or whatever that say. say put say your money where your mouth is. Yes, <laughs> okay. is, is my third Or language. walk the talk. Mm -hmm. where we are. We are doing that. So I, um, we are uh, an HSI now institution at South Dakota uh, Hispanic Serving Institution. So there's a lot of effort underway to uh, to change everything. We're not there yet, but uh, good. We're making good progress. Thank you for allowing us to share. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually want to ask you a follow-up question because you said that you all are undergoing or participating in trainings every Friday. What are some of the topics that you all are um, being trained on? So the most recent one, and uh, because of my busy schedule, I have to say I skipped uh, one or two, but the most recent one is about the white privilege. We're having hard discussions Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we go into work groups and actually the, I, I've been in different uh, groups because as a North African, there was no group for me. Mm. Uh, they put me with white. I say, no, I don't identify myself with white. They put me with Latinx. I mean, they had, we, there's so much, I'm the only one. So I've been floating in a way, but it's very interesting because it's with the, uh, with uh, with our college, with our employees, and we're having hard discussion. And Dr. Regina Stroud is doing an excellent work with her team to facilitate. And then, uh, in fact, she was at the Strengthening Student Success Conference uh, recently here in Orange County, and we got to meet her in person. But uh, we're yes, and, and they give us readings. They, they even um, we're going through the 21 day habit where we have a log. Um, that we record everything we do not or say, not just at work, but also at home. So it's mm -hmm. very comprehensive. Good, good. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And I see some um, things going on in the chat, sharing of resources. Thank you so much. Um, if I could weigh in on the request for some resources and books, let me just, I was grabbing the ones from various points in my office, but um, First conversation about race, required reading, I feel like. Mm -hmm. 
the uh, cultural proficiency manual for school leaders, another mm -hmm. good one. Mm -hmm. um, blind spot, also a very good one. I was like, where is my blind spot? It was on my futon because I was sitting there reading it. That's a good one. Um, race on the brain. Race on the brain is a very good one too. That's a good one to read. Um, and then if you're interested in identifying, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole digital redlining thing that it's been talked about a lot and that kind of stuff, but Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin is a really good book. Um, it's called Race After Technology, The New Gym Code um, is really good and it kind of lets you identify where these different things are. But the interesting thing about how to be an, um, <laughs> oh, an anti-racist, yeah, that's a really good one. Um, but yes, there's a lot of different things that you would want to kind of engage with depending on how you're looking at stuff and what your focus is. If you've already been thinking about bias and, and implicit bias and those kinds of things, you're ready to move forward then you're ready to start dealing and digging into the deeper work and things like that. So understanding things like digital redlining, how students who live in low-income areas are, might be having a hard time accessing technology they need for your classrooms and things of that nature are really helpful. Um, everyday bias is a good one. Um, and I also think reading some um, autobiographies by people who have experienced these types of things are really great. Um, let me find, there's one that I really, really, really like. And let me find this book. Where'd it go? Um, covering the other Westmore. There's a bunch. Ta-Nehisi Coates. I don't know if you've heard of this book by ta Coates, Between the World and Me. Um, it's a very good book that basically explains how he came to realize that I'm a Black man, and as a Black man, I deal with things differently. Another really good book is by Kenji Yashino. It's called Covering, and it's about kind of the code switching that happens and how you feel like you have to hide who you are in order to fit in and stuff like that. I have literally this whole shelf is nothing but like bias, equity, <laughs> inclusion books. So I'd be happy to send a reading list, but there's a lot of really great meeting material, reading material out there. But I agree that blind spot, um, there's another book called We Can't Talk About This at Work, which is all about having conversations around race in the workplace and doing that in a healthy manner and moving past that this is stigmatized conversation that we don't have into a place where we do have these conversations in the workplace because we need to be having it and not being ahead of the sand. So that was just like a quick and dirty, here's a bunch of stuff and I'll put all the links into the chat for you. Thank you so much, Sudi. And again, so glad you were able to join us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Um, anyone else would like to share um, how your um, agency or district um, is addressing equity or how you are in your classroom at the school site? Um, my district's doing, right now we're doing an eight-week training on um, equity and um, uh, social justice. So, and it's, uh, they brought some outside presenters and it's been a really, really good. Um, the book, um, it tells about a teaching program, um, a partnership between like LA Unified, some other districts down in Southern California and um, UCLA. It's called Preparing and Sustaining Social Justice Educators. It's really, really interesting. Um, it's, it's been a really good um, PD so far. Wonderful, wonderful. And within that PD, what are some of the um, the topics you all are covering? Um, basically, um, we're not actually going through the actual book. People are, each group is reporting out, but the actual basis of the, the in-person piece is um, kind of the same, same things that we just discussed in your last PD, mm -hmm. uh, microaggressions, uh, proper words to say, what's appropriate to say, what's, you know, things like that. So um, that piece has been uh, really good. They also bring in um, uh, one of the other presenters is uh, in a wheelchair. So they bring in all the IDEA and, and, and those things and what's the proper terminology for someone um, who is, um, ha does have a disability. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really um, eye-opening. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, anyone else want to share? All right. So um, for those of you who have shared and for those of you who may have not shared um, as of yet, um, when you think about some of the equity initiatives that have taken place, you know, at your school site, in the classroom, 
um, within the district, so on and so forth. What um, are what has been some of the successes in terms of maybe you know feedback that you have received, student outcomes, um, so on and so forth? What's been some of the successes? And success can mean anything, um, whether it be a change in a shift in mindset, you know, more individuals engaging in the work who may have not otherwise done so without undergoing a specific training. Have you seen any successes up until this point? For me, it's just been helpful to be more reflective as, as an administrator um, and to um, kind of reflect on my own process. And I've um, gotten a little more um, a little more braver about having conversations if I need to with staff. Mm -hmm. So that's been, that's been helpful for me. Wonderful. Yeah. The critical self-reflection or self-reflection in general is so, mm -hmm. so um, integral in this work for sure. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Karima. I think adult education at Salvec is also contributing to changing the tapestry of the college. We're bringing in more, uh, uh, I'm trying not to use the word, I was at Shelton's uh, presentation yesterday and I loved it. And I use some of the words I learned not to say yellow, multilinguals, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so bringing in students with potential to the college. And I, anecdotally, I can see more people of color on campus. I've been here for a long time to see that gradual shift. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't looked at data lately, but mm -hmm. we are changing the culture. Yes, and we're becoming more diverse than uh, let's say seven or 10 years ago. We as a college uh, succeeded in changing even uh, the, the gaucho, Salvac College gauchos, where are now the Bobcats? And that was a multi-year process. I think that's what comes to mind as a, a change or outcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have to go to a meeting. I apologize that I'm chairing. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a good mm -hmm. afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Anyone you know, else? Veronica, one of the things I've noticed is that we started out in, in I think, I want to say like 2019-20, when we started really having these conversations. And um, at first, people were kind of hesitant. Then 2020, people were like, we have to talk about this right now. This is really urgent. And then last year we saw some pullback and people were not as engaging as much. And I think maybe just exhaustion, exhaustion, mm -hmm. ongoing COVID pivots, fatigue, I think had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. I know there were points in which I myself was getting um, drained from, you know, just having doing this work so much, you know what I mean? And I needed to do some self-care too, but I've noticed it feels like, um, that we're kind of coming out of that and that there's a lot more happening in terms of moving from that awareness of inequity and awareness of these concerns into like acting on it and like mm -hmm. having people putting things about you know um, into this their SIPs and their three-year plans I think um, that encouragement to plan like a smarty for the continuous improvement plan was helpful I think mm -hmm. um, it's interesting when we have these dialogues and hearing about how people are wanting to put their PD on around racial equity or equity in general as part of their three-year planning or their one-year plan mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff so I think we're seeing a shift in which people are coming back to the table to continue having these conversations mm -hmm. and where it's becoming ingrained into the work. Mm -hmm. It's not happening enough yet, but it is <laughs> happening. And right. I think it's been helpful to have people um, like CDE, like the chancellor's office, like really um, advocating for and encouraging an intentional focus on equity in general and not pretending racial inequity doesn't exist and those kinds of things. So I think mm -hmm. having our leadership kind of spearheading that and championing that is, has been really helpful mm -hmm. in getting and modeling that this is important. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, also thinking about who those are who are in positions of leadership and knowing that quite to, this is near and dear to some of their hearts. Like uh, I talked with Dr. Zachary about this 2017-18, I want to say, when we were just talking about the National Alliance for Partnership of Equity, and to see how much this has grown and blossomed and sustained and how it's continuing to grow is really, really cool. And so I think the more we continue nurturing it and getting, you know, that support from leadership and knowing that we have passionate people at the top and all the way throughout is really helping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Thank you for that share, Gino. So Sudi, just a question. You're much more read about the EI than I am. <clears throat> in, your, in all of your reading and all of your experience, people who look like me are, is it, is it more often not a, not a, a pretense, but a belief system or is it a pretense? Is what a pretense? Pre, uh, you said pretending that inequity doesn't exist. Oh, is that a pretense? I don't is it know. A pretense or a belief system? I don't know if it, that it's necessarily either. And I think that's not like, I don't think there's a blanket response for that because I think it depends on the person who looks like you. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there are some people who look just like you who for decades have been you know, beating this drum and talking about it. Um, before, it didn't take George Floyd to be murdered for them to suddenly care about this. You know what I mean? And let's just right. be real. When we look back and even to the 1800s, there were always white allies who were helping run these secret schools for the when it was it, it literally illegal to educate black people. Um, mm -hmm. We had the Quakers who were helping to run the Underground Railroad. There have always been white allies. And so I don't think it's necessarily a blanket white people type of thing. I think there are well, yeah. individuals within different demographic groups who some of them, I think some people do have a belief that of in terms of superiority, in terms of xenophobia, in terms of all these other things that they are really ingrained, like they really truly believe that their ethnicity or their race is superior to others. And I also will go as far as to say, that's not just a white people thing mm -hmm. that exists mm -hmm. in so many different demographics, right? But I also want to be clear that there's a lot of white people who have been at the forefront and have stood right next to people of color to have these conversations and push these dialogues. And we talked about at the end of our um, the Q and A at the end of the other session when we talk about um, the you know kind of these kind of blanket terms and things like that. That Martin Luther King and his words about the white liberal is really fascinating the things that he wrote and said, because he basically was talking about you're our friends and you're saying all of these great things, but is there the action behind it mm -hmm. and the advocacy and those kinds of things. So while he also acknowledged the white people that were supporting, he also acknowledged that there are some who are saying they're supporting, but not actively doing anything, right? And that's actually scarier than the person who's openly racist because they might be working against you in the background. So I don't think there's like a one blanket term or one blanket answer to that. I think it really depends on the individual, where, they were, where their upbringing was, where the, what they were taught and what they truly believe. And the other thing I also believe is that hearts and minds can always be changed when people are educated. Yep. And I truly believe that. Yep, educated and a willingness. A willingness, yeah. Willful ignorance is still a problem. Let's mm -hmm. just be completely honest about mm -hmm. that. But that was a really good question, Gina. Yeah. I, yeah, and I, I hesitated asking it because of the compartmentalization, because if we say it's one or the other, then we're guilty. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't leave necessarily a lot of wiggle room for change, no. right? And I fully believe, and maybe I'm just overly optimistic, but I really and truly believe people's hearts and minds can change yep. if they're willing to um, and if they want to. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, I don't feel like there's space in education systems in general, but especially not in an education system as diverse as California adult education for people to not be willing to move forward positive change for the support of our students. Mm -hmm. Uh, may I say one more thing? Of course. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say this especially to Veronica or anyone else who was at um, my presentation yesterday. Uh, I, <clears throat> after yesterday afternoon, I went into my slides and I looked for the word American. I found twelve, and I changed them all to U.S. Mm. So I, I can't. I can only speak about my experience really because I'm not in an organization as such right mm -hmm. now. But mm -hmm. I'm, I was there yesterday to learn. I'm here today to learn. Uh, I'm, I own my biases. I've been to Project Implicit many times. Uh, Me too. So next, my next <laughs> question is, yeah. My next question is, I tell my students about Project Implicit. And I tell them, yeah, I have my biases. But I don't tell them what my biases are. I do. You do. Okay. I own my biases. I do. I actually tell the story about how I found out about my biases. I mean, I went to a conference session and I found out that, you know, like they were talking about Project Implicit and I go back to my hotel and I'm like, I'm gonna do all these bias assessments. And so like the first few were just like, great. And I'm like, see, 
I'm not racist. I'm not homophobic. I don't have any problems. And then I got to the males versus females one, and it clearly indicated a bias. And I was like, oh, I have a dad, brothers, sons. My best friend is a dude. What do you mean, right? But then I started look. I like started literally. I took the challenge that was given to us in the session. Like, look at where your bias could reside within your practice and your work, right? Mm -hmm. And I realized in our marketing material, we were super super specific to make sure females were included in trades, but we did not have the same courtesy for males and predominantly female dominated careers like medical, like accounting, like those kinds of things. And I realized, and I was the one who picked the imagery. There's nobody I could blame for that. So I clearly had a bias in terms of making sure women were included, but not men. Right. And so like these kind of things, and I think it's important for us as we're doing this work to own our own missteps, because if we're not afraid to say where we're learning and growing, then other people become more comfortable telling us where they're learning and growing. Right. And I'd like that you shared, you know, you changed your slides. I was just going through a training and technical assistance plan. And I noticed we used the word stakeholders like a lot. And I recently realized, I was recently told actually a few months back, like why stakeholders is a terrible term to use. And I was like, I'm not saying this ever again anymore, right? So then I'm looking at the plan and I'm like, why do we use this word so many times? And I'm going through and wordsmithing to remove it. Like there's connotation. What? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say why, because I yes. used it too. Mm -hmm. So Same. think about it historically, who were stakeholders? Oh. Oh. <laughs> It's negative, it's a negative connotation, especially in California, where we had a lot of Asian people who were responsible for building up the railroad and holding those stakes and oftentimes mm. injured, right? And hurt. And so to be so flippant and be like, oh, the stakeholders, these are just the invested people. Were the original mm. stakeholders actually invested or were they kind of shoved into that position and then oftentimes injured and disregarded, right? Mm. And so when someone pointed out to me, once I pointed it out, I was like, oh snap, I had no idea. And so yeah. it's like, we're all continuously learning and growing. And I think it's Absolutely. important to give ourselves grace mm -hmm. and just, and not expect that like we are going to get to a point where we know any and everything about every right. culture and how to be right. exactly perfect in this walk. I think the right. biggest thing is to actively work towards improvement and change and the betterment for the, for the sake of our students and, and the population we serve. Absolutely. And speaking of words, um, yesterday when Ken had shared that slide of um, where he was talking about ELL and underrepresented and some other words, mm -hmm. I thought about my dissertation and how I utilize those words. Like, I think it was, there were maybe nine or 10. And I want to mm -hmm. say I used at least six of them repeatedly mm. in my, in my dissertation. So that was definitely an aha moment for me in terms of how not only do I utilize those words, but how I even align to some of those words, such as underrepresented and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the other words. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and Anna mentioned in the chat, um, I like that you are mentioning about women and men. This will help us create more spaces for men, Latinos and Brown, not attending college as as same um as the same yes. of women. Mm -hmm. that was you know when we were doing the research for the brief veronica the the numbers the number differences between the different <laughs> demographic groups is what like blew my mind mm -hmm. like how do we have this many more females than males right that's fascinating it's so fascinating and it, like i guess there's a I think part of it is that we know that there's a large English language acquisition population, right? But then there's a, some assumptions we make in adult ed that a reason, part of the reason the um, it's primarily women is because they're at home and they're taking care of the kids and they're et cetera. But have we actually like surveyed to ask that question? Have we looked at how we promote and market to see if we could get more males in our programs? Like there's a lot of things to think about. And then I think the other thing um, and this has just been like kind of a, a thing for me. I bought a t-shirt that says, if you embrace diversity and ignore disability, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to get very narrowly focused on, yeah. on DEI and on equity. Yeah. And mm -hmm. while racial equity is super important, and there's a reason why that has come to the forefront, especially in recent years, we don't want to lose track of like the A and DEI and A accessibility. Mm -hmm. And right. thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, that sexism and ageism also happen and mm -hmm. that homophobia exists and that we have students with an ableism is a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? We have students with disabilities. So mm -hmm. when we start looking broadly, you know, we won't, don't want to abandon these other things that are also just as important when we're thinking about serving our students. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The disability part definitely resonates. My father is blind mm -hmm. and him experiencing all of the inequities, especially in the medical system, definitely mm -hmm. was eye opening and how, you know, I was fixated on race, uh, racial equity in particular, but now I have this newfound awareness as well as my sister who's a lesbian. So mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I learned it through my, I have a sister who's a quadriplegic and I never used to pay attention to accessibility until I started taking trips with her. Mm -hmm. And now I notice mm -hmm. everything like, yep. why is your parking structure not leaving space for us to open her van door, but it's supposed to be accessible parking, like these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't pay attention as much to accessibility in the classroom until I had a colorblind student tell me he couldn't read the slides. And then I was stupidly mm -hmm. asked by teaching aid. I was like, can you see it? You're the back room. She's like, yeah, I can see it. And I'm like, I don't understand why you can't see it. Like, I don't get it. And then he was like, and he whispered, he's like, I, it's because I'm colorblind. I can't see it. I felt so ridiculous and ashamed that I kind of had put him on blast on accident thinking I'm going to prove that you can see it. <laughs> when actually he's like, this is a disability I'm trying to quietly share with you. And you did not handle this appropriately. You know what I mean? Like he didn't say that. He gave me a lot of grace, but I felt terrible. But ever since then, I became way more in tune to like color contrast compliance and mm -hmm. do using contrast checkers and seeing, making sure people could actually physically see things and that things are closed captioned and mm -hmm. all of that. That just became, it's, you know, it was a lesson for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was finding myself um, kind of looking at when people would park in um, the, um, I'm trying to think of the right word because we're not even supposed to use handicapped anymore. Um, accessibility the, parking. The accessibility parking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, like looking and seeing like what seems to be an able-bodied person getting out of the car and seeing and, and saying to myself, well, you know, what are they doing? And then thinking, I have two kids that have um, disabilities that you can't see. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. I like really had to check myself because I was like, what am I doing? Because my, you know, one of my kids could e eventually possibly need that accessibility. And here I was trying to, you know, figure out, well, you know, they look fine to me. People. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, I think a lot of us have been guilty of that. Like we're trying to get in the parking space and someone else whips into the accessible parking and you're like, <laughs> They don't even look disabled. What is going on? But realistically, <laughs> that's such a judgmental thing to do. We don't mm -hmm. know what someone's experiencing and what they're going through or what abilities or disabilities they may have. And they don't owe us an explanation. Like, you mm -hmm. know, and there's, and there's, these are a lot of things that become more eye opening as you start engaging more with various um, forms of abilities with amongst different groups and people. And then, you know, like if you spend a lot of time with deaf people, you start becoming hyper aware of what's not accessible for someone who is deaf, right? Spend a lot of time with someone in a wheelchair, you start identifying what's not accessible. Someone who's, you know, visually impaired, you start noticing these things. And so I think the goal is for us to start becoming more aware of these things without it having to directly impact us first, right? Because that's where mm -hmm. we tend to care more when it impacts us than we do when it doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. And that's an area of growth for me, I know. Yeah, same, same. All right. That's been really, really good um, dialogue. Um, so if anyone else have anything else to share, I'll move on to another question um, that has come up a little bit, um, I believe. But um, I believe it was you, Sudi, or maybe someone else who um, talked about engaging students. So um, how are you all engaging students in equitable in creating, excuse me, equitable spaces. Anyone want to share? So we, we, I, go ahead, Gino, sorry. It's more of a question. <clears throat> when students would <clears throat> express microaggressions toward a certain type of person or when they would make a racist or sexist statement. I used to engage with them Socratically. And then I learned a little bit about becoming an anti-racist and changed that, changed from engaging with the students Socratically to just calling out that's a that's a racist or sexist or whatever statement. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And on two occasions, the students dropped the course after I changed my strategy. I, I'm just not sure 
and I recognize that I'm while I'm effective at the Socratic method, I'm a new anti-racist. Uh, I'm a novice at, so my skills probably aren't so good. My question is, what's next? What do I, how do I help students persist but act in an anti-racist fashion? So, I have some questions. <laughs> sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So when you're, so when you say you're addressing it, initially we're addressing it in more of a Socratic um, fashion. So you were just sort of kind of taking them to the side, quietly engaging it. And then you moved to calling it out when you see it. But when you would call it out when you see it, like what kind of language, what kind of body language, how were you, what was the reaction? What was your, your physical and verbal reaction when that happened? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the part that's hard hard for me to describe because we're we were in Zoom. Mm. So I, I can I can address my um, mm. my tone, but I can't really address my body language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, so the statement was, "Why are there so many?" This is um, from a person who was not black. Why are there so Why are so many people black people lazy? Mm. And in the past, I would say something like, "Well, what makes you think they're lazy?" And I would it mm. it was I was kind of giving them a soapbox because no, I wasn't taking them off to the side. I was engaged. and then adding to the micro invalidation and micro insult. And That's right. Insult. Yeah, my, my questioning was, yeah, it's like it's like the the coverage of no, I shouldn't say that. Um, I was good. I was going to say it's like covering Donald Trump and everything he says, mm. right? Uh, we magnify that. So when I said, you know, that's that's just not true. It's black people aren't any lazier than anyone else. Um, she got really angry, and I know that my and she wanted to keep going. And I know that my voice became more and more stern, not angry, just stern. And then I had to I had to turn her mic off. Wow. So, so I can't point to like anything specifically that you could, should have done differently in that conversation, because realistically, it's not a best practice to reinforce a micro invalidation by questioning, well, why do you think that? Instead, it's important to call out what it is, say what it is, and be um, firm yet kind in, in your approach. I've listened to you talk, I don't know how many times, do you know, and it's hard for me to imagine an angry tone <laughs> in general. I have my teacher being, voice. Even when you're being serious and, and assertive, it still doesn't have that like disgruntled, angry, abrasiveness of right. it. So, um, but the fact is, as much as we want to make every person anti-racist, as much as we want to change every racist heart, that's not always going to be the case. And the bottom line for me is um, that it, sometimes you do have to just kind of pluck it out by the root, if that's the case. And that means that and if when you're being honest and saying we don't have space for racism here, and that's not how that how that works, and all Black people are not lazy, someone offended enough by that to be like, I'm not going to come to your class anymore. I'm not sure that there's, I mean, you can follow up with them. You can try to give them resources and access to learning. But I'm not sure that there's much more chasing down you can do. Of course, we want all students to get to persist. We want all students to make it through. But at the end of the day, are we going to sacrifice our students of color, um, multiple who might have been in your class and heard that conversation and statement in order to appease one person who is being explicitly biased, right? Um, and right. I think the answer to that is no, we don't, we're not going to do that. But I do always advocate for approaching things from a place of kindness and education and learning. But if someone's not, if someone's not open to that, then they just aren't. Veronica, I'm going to pass to you because I know you have thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I actually typed it in the chat. Um, it goes back to what we were speaking about in the beginning of this is, you know, individuals having that openness and that willingness to change or being open to change. And it appears to me, just based on what you have said, is that this individual may not have been at a place where they were ready, willing, and open to change, but may have been seeking validation, maybe from you to, you know, validate what the stereotype that they believe. And with that, 
there's like Sudi said, there's nothing that really you can do. And to me, it, it felt like you you did your due diligence in trying to um, change that that person's perspective or open them up to learn more or to learn how this was not right or how this is not true, so on and so forth. And, you know, it goes back to this work really starts with self and no strategy, no book, no um, video, whatever the case may be, is going to be helpful unless that person is willing, ready, and open to change. Right. Yeah, it, okay. It makes sense. The, the first thing she said when she got angry without me asking a leading question was, I'm not racist. And for me, it was just the cognitive dissonance was... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I hate to laugh, but that's just like, it's kind of, it, it's a little typical and it's kind of anticipated, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, there's just some things that you can anticipate are gonna be said. I'm not racist. I have insert ethnicity here, friends, like, you know, et yeah. cetera. Um, like realistically, you can have a people who are of, of, of a, a different group or ethnicity that are members of your own family and there you could still, people can still harbor bias, you know what I mean? So. Yeah you know, it's just, it is what it is. But I mean, I think of it this way, like we want to try to bring along all the students that we can as much as we can, just as we want to do that with staff too. But there becomes a point where we have to decide in terms of how much am I going to allow to happen to allow my students in this situation to have to deal with, you know, racist behavior, terminology, et cetera, or do I err on the side of my students the, by and large and correct this one individual to help in hopes that they will move them so they'll move forward right the same thing can be said when it comes to staff right if you're if you have a staff member who is actively not helping to move equity forward they've dug their heels in and they're saying white privilege is a myth privilege in general is a myth everybody needs to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and i'm colorblind but i'm not racist and that's their whole messaging and they refuse <laughs> to do anything else and then they're also like misgendering students this is an extreme example but they're also misgendering students refusing to say people's names the right way and they're just a problem right are you going to keep that person on staff forever despite the fact that their presence might be detrimental to your students probably not right there's going to be some kind of actions you try we try to help them learn we do them the professional development we help that they're going to move along and move forward but there comes a point where you have to determine are you going to remain in your willful ignorance zone or are you going to come with us as we move forward with our students and if the answer is i'm not going to move with us as we move forward with our students then there's a conversation to be had but i think that I think in a perfect world, racism would not exist. Sexism would not exist. Homophobia would not exist. None of these phobias would exist and we could not even have to have this conversation. But I think we are a really long way from a perfect world. And I think these type of conversations are gonna keep happening. And I think there's gonna be some points when you're just gonna have to be like, I did my very best, but I didn't change them. And that happens sometimes. Anna, I see your name is, your hand is up. I I just um it just I just remember right now a comment that it was made um in my family and someone brought it up because sometimes it gets just certain things that gets brought up in the family and this was during my uncle's um not necessarily funeral but it was like the family getting together prior to the funeral mm -hmm. and so the the situation was a little tense and one of my cousins um children um oh god it I even hurts just because I I didn't I wanted to say something but it was just so hard and I'm I'm just like I just almost want to cry so the, the 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 uh my cousin's child um he's a teen at that time he was a teenager and he says oh I went to a Chinese restaurant and the child and I just told the the business owner that I wanted some wow wow. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, what is that? Like I I I was, and everyone else has started laughing. And I'm like, just like stunned. And I'm like, no, this is wrong. Like, should I say something? And but the situation was just so tense that I'm just like, they're looking at me and I'm not laughing. And I, I was, I just felt like numb. And I'm just like, should I just start the conversation? Because they're not used to, like, it's they're used to like everyone else laughing. And so, um, and I didn't say anything. And he said it again. 
and and I um I just felt really really awkward and it was more because of of the situation also of my 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 uncle that had just passed away and so I'm like I don't want this it, it was it was really hard for me and I just had the conversation with my dad recently and I said dad it was so wrong that I didn't say anything and and next time I will say something like it doesn't matter if it would like it's an education within our own family that we need to respect other people's culture and there are certain things that they are not tolerated and and right now it's it's like the first time that I I express it in in a more of an open um setting that but it was maybe like three days ago four days ago that I was telling dad because my dad is right now it's in Mexico and there's a situation that happened within like one small village to with another small village that it was a literally there was a conversation that was taking place and someone was in in, in a disagreement and and the and they got into a fight and then the other person went to their own village they got a gun and they brought it in and shot the other person luckily the other person is not dead and i think that this is the situation that is like us in education of educating within our family at, and in and, and bringing situations that sometimes it feels really uncomfortable but that we are the ones that are educating other people how how we need to treat other people. Thank you for listening. So true and so familiar. <laughs> I'm black. I don't know if you knew, but if we could tell, black. <laughs> My husband is white, and um, his family is French, Irish, and English, right? And recent my in my family, my in laws are amazing. They're great. They're wonderful, and they're pretty familiar with the work I do. But my mother in law, only in the past year or so, became comfortable enough to like start asking some questions about things that she didn't understand about it. And so she was like, "I grew up where we were colorblind was good. We didn't. We shouldn't see race. We shouldn't talk about race. Like, what's wrong with being like? What's wrong with that specifically, right?" And I was like, "Well." You know, like when I look at you, I see that you have beautiful blue eyes. I see that you have brown hair. Would I ever look at you and be like, I don't see eye color. I don't see hair color. And she's like, no. And I was like, so why are we okay with saying that about skin when it's such a prominent part of our bodies? And she was like, oh yeah, that's just like, that makes sense. But I was like, yeah, we like, we just have to see people for who they are. Right. And then I also remember a conversation with my brother-in-law where he decided that he thought it would be funny at a Chinese restaurant to order in what he thought was a Chinese accent and just sounded ridiculous, right? And I was just like, what is wrong with you? Why would you, why would you even do that, right? And so it's not to say that like only white people ever missed up and do this, obviously. And I think Anna for sharing that, like we have all heard the racial jokes, the, the, accent jokes the all these different types of things and it's just never okay and I think we have to be able to be strong enough to say that to even people that we love no matter how funny we think they normally are that yo that's just not cool and that's racist um like I don't know how many times I've used that little meme of the little black boy who's yelling that's racist I send that to people all the time like if they say this I see it I hear it I'm posting it and I'm like that's racist I put it in our group chat all the mm -hmm. time like why would you even say that that's not okay um, so I'll be the wet blanket all the time. I'm perfectly com comfortable doing that <laughs> and calling it out when I see it. And I think we need people who are going to say, even to their family members, it's not okay. Because let's just think about it. Racism, that's, it's taught. We see it growing up. We hear these things, right? And we're never going to end that cycle and change that until we stop allowing it to permeate. Yeah, absolutely. Because when we think about adults, yes, we have the opportunity to change and you know, reframe our thinking, but I always think about the the young, the kids, you know, kids in our families, kids in our households, so on and so forth. We don't want to continue to perpetuate the vicious cycle of, um, you know, being racist. And so, yeah, it starts at home, starts with self, it starts at home. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Anna, did you put your hand back up? I, I did. And I think it was because then I followed the conversation with my father. And again, it was through the phone. Um, and I said to him, dad there's something also going on in los angeles and something that happened with city councils yeah. that it's very inappropriate and i said and i said i'm i'm not sure really what's going to happen with two of the city councils because one of them already dropped i said but the same thing i said they have children 
And, and, and last week I heard um, in Univision in one of the, the Spanish channels that they um, someone was interviewing um, De Leon, the city council of Los Angeles. And, and the question was asked that his mother already passed away. And, and he says, and, and she was, and she worked in, in, in housekeeping. And, and the, the interviewer asked like, how do you think your mother would have felt that she was so many times uh, discriminated and now having the son and he did say that it's like I, I feel the shame and at the same time it's it's definitely owning it but at the same time it's like what else are you doing to recuperate especially when someone is in 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 a public or an education that they have a status in in our own systems uh, to continue it, to be an education moment. And at the same time, like it's, it, I, I don't know the history of like how much support he has really done for for the the community in Los Angeles, but at the same time of it, it, that within, within our own communities, like, I mean, it's his family was from Mexico and in degrading another a Mexican just because they are a, a darker skin and shorter person. Colorism. Uh, that's I feel like that's a whole separate conversation. Maybe <laughs> even a whole demographic groups could talk about that. Separate <laughs> PD series. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so um, colorism. Colorism. Mm -hmm. Colorism. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, can I say something about that? I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I was just going to share. I had attended um, Lyrics PD Day last weekend or a couple weekends ago, and um, their keynote, and I cannot remember her name at the moment, but they um, she had shared a video on color color blindness versus color bravery. You can find it on YouTube by uh, Melody, Melanie or Melody Hop Hobson. Um, it's a great video about colorism. So yeah, I just wanted to share that. Go ahead, Gina. So I haven't been discriminated against much. I was going to say ever, uh, really? <laughs> I, I, Heightism, once I was told I couldn't uh, be a PE teacher because I was too short. Mm -hmm. And no one has ever said to me, I, I want to marry a uh, tall, white, or a short, white guy. So it was <laughs> tall, dark. Uh, oh. But the one, the one that's really interesting to me is um, I have vitiligo and my skin tone was somewhere between Mandalese and Sudis. And I am was an international traveler, still am, but not as much. And I would get stopped. I had, I had really dark skin, uh, a bushy, bushy beard and a, um, an Arabic stamp on the outside of my passport. And I got stopped in airports constantly. And now I never do. Mm. Never get stopped. Right. So yeah, I, I assume it's an instance of colorism. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's a the stereotype, <laughs> racism, assumptions people are making. Veronica, remember that time we were at the airport and you got stopped for having too many coins and my hair got padded? <laughs> yep. But I, I uh, Melinda was able that. to get through, but oh, no, no problem. That was who else? Who was with us? Somebody else got stopped too. <laughs> was, I want to say maybe Netta. It was Netta. Yes, it was Netta. What the heck? Yes, we were coming from where was it? Um, was it where were we coming from? The summit, San Diego, I think. It was San Diego. San Diego. I don't remember. It was a conference, and we mm -hmm. just happened to all be on the same flight and at the same gate, and we're all just we had gone to eat lunch together. We're all going through to get security together. I get stopped first and they're patting my hair and like whatever. But I got through relatively quickly. After a while, we're waiting for Netta and Veronica. Netta had too many books and Veronica had too much change. That was when we both got stopped. And, and I remember Melinda being like horrified, like, what? I was like, oh, this happens all the time. We were, and we were like, this happens all the time at the airport. Have you never seen this one? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> before, I cut, before I cut my hair, I used to wear extensions. And like Mandalese, and I used to get stopped all the time and pat it in my my head because they thought that I was you know hiding something in there. Oh my! Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. But I hate to break this up. First of all, 
I didn't even realize that it has been an hour since we've been. <laughs> oh, has talking. it? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it is after two o'clock. Our session ended at two. Um, this is what I hate about time sometimes um, mm-hmm. because, you know, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but just know that I know for me personally, this has been such a uh, fulfilling conversation. Spending this last hour with you all has been amazing and I appreciate everyone and your voices even if you didn't speak I mm-hmm. appreciate your voices because you were in the room and hopefully you you got some value out of the conversation um and it's definitely an opportunity or an awareness to know that you know we can continuously have this conversation and hopefully people continue to join us and continue to learn and grow and so on and so forth so um yes thank you thank you thank you any and closing remarks so just um I'm gonna do my tech hosting responsibilities really quick. Um, You know, there was a lot of great shares in the chat. So I I just want to remind the people that are here in the lower right hand corner of your chat, there's those three dots, click on that, save the chat if you want to grab those links, the names of um, books, as well as there's all all of the good valuable chats there. Um, And then as we uh, back to my tech host duties. Uh, There will be an evaluation that pops up on the schedule. I lost my sheet to share with you all. Um, So please take time to fill out that evaluation so we can continue to have these conversations, make space and make time, Um, as well as join us. And this will be my shameless plug at 2.30 for our next session, uh, Designing for Equity with Veronica Veronica Parker and myself. So I hope to see you all there. And Sudi, thank you for joining and everyone else that's here. I'm, I'm you see, know, see what happens when my meeting everybody. gets canceled. I get to show up. <laughs> Have a yes, beautiful yes. day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take thank care. You. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. See you in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.